with us. We're going to be in John chapter 13 and 1 Peter chapter 4. John chapter 13 and 1 Peter chapter 4. We are kind of rounding out uh, what I'm calling like my sabbatical sermons. I've been gone. I've gone on sabbatical for six weeks and there were just a bunch of topics kind of like percolating and I believe from the Holy Spirit, uh, not the least of which was for me, but also just for us as a church. And so next week we'll be back into 2 Kings for every book for all of life. Looking forward to that. But 1 Peter 4 verse 8 and John 13 35 this morning. So I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads with me and pray uh, for us that he would change us, that the Holy Spirit would convict us, and then we might be different. God, uh, we are grateful uh, that we have your word in that, uh, God, the words written down that we have are not uh, some dusty, useless, powerless words, but, the, but they are, are living and active. They pierce uh, beyond our armor to our souls, beyond joint and marrow. They rightly divide who we are. So, God, we pray that you would move us away from distraction this morning. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would do your work of conviction of sin, illumination of Scripture, that we might understand it better, that we might understand who Jesus is and what then is required of us. And Lord, as we talk about relational reconciliation, as we talk about uh, living uh, as a body of people who love you, who have different opinions, different backgrounds, different freedoms, and uh, and God, and and we live, we're we're also sinners, and we live in close proximity to one another in relationship. God, help us today to... Uh, to find freedom in your word, to find freedom in forgiveness, to find hope uh, from the cross. So we give you this time, we give you our hearts and our lives to do with what would bring you the most glory and bring us the most joy. Uh, we ask that we move mightily today, Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Y'all remember COVID? <laughs> there was like this period of time uh, like, I don't know, like a year where we all became amateur virologists, right? Where we started studying like r knots and, uh, ex- you know, uh, mask tendencies and, uh, you know, how to, you know, we were just, we all suddenly became pharmacologists and knew everything. And what's interesting is if you are a dad, that's just people catching up to you. Because one of the things, one of the things they don't, they don't teach you about in becoming a dad is you have these young kids and as the kids... Uh, are most in your home, they're like never sick. And then they go hang around other people's kids. And uh, they like preschool. And all of a sudden they come home sick and the dad becomes a virologist. Don't breathe. Go to your room. Wash yourself with Clorox. <laughs> we begin to isolate our kids. We, we're curious about how contagious they are, how resilient our family system is. And you really, like as a dad, you begin to realize how dirty other people's kids are, right? Uh, like last week, one of our, one of our kids came home and, uh, and she, he was, I don't really feel great, but she had bright eyes and smiling. And we're like, okay. And then another hour, she's like, I still, my stomach doesn't feel right. And uh, she goes, dad, I, I got this fever. And so like, you kind of watch this progression. Everything was fine at like 3.30. And then by 4.30 or 5, we're in urgent care and she's puked like five times. And they went to Albertson. She puked two more times there. It was really gross, hour and a half. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh no, All right? This is, it's the yearly bug, right? That your kids bring home and it's 24, 48 hours and then it's just a gastrointestinal disaster, right? And you're just like, how can I, how can I minimize this? And how can I, how can I quarantine you? And despite our best efforts, it rips and roars through our house, right? Like this last week, I was in distress on Wednesday and, uh, and Tuesday. And like, there's this thing, like, you know, you get the virus, you don't really know you've got it and everything's fine on the outside. It begins to multiply. Uh, and, and, and the more it takes over the different parts of your body, the more sick you begin to come and your eyes become glazed over and you get this fever and you just kind of become forlorn. And then uh, as it continues to take its effect, you begin to have all of the symptoms of the virus and become sick and you can't, you lay down and you're basically immobilized. And before you know it, like the whole family is sick and looks like it. It's pretty similar for a church. It's pretty similar for a church. Uh, People who come from different backgrounds, different opinions, different maturity levels, different sin struggles. 
It's not hard for the virus of unity or disunity, I should say, to sneak its way in through sin and a lack of reconciliation and bitterness and resentment and anger. And it spreads through broken relationships and it spreads through gossip and it spreads uh, through uh, lying unchecked in our own souls and relationships and small resentment grows into bitterness, grows into grumbling and, and, and it begins to affect the whole body that, that a body that looked healthy then begins to be uh, sick because a lack of relational reconciliation and love for one another begins to infect and, and really permeate the culture of a church. You say, like, that's not me. I don't really know what you're talking about. I don't want you to raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand. But some of you came to church today going, I'm going to take the long way around the lobby because I don't want to see the person when they walk in because if I see them, blank, 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 blank. Or I don't want to see this person because of what they said to me or did to me. Or I, I, can't, I can't even worship in the same area, so I'm going to go to the, I'm gonna go to the 1045 and not the 9, because I know I won't have to see them. I won't have to worry about whatever bitterness I've got, whatever resentment. And like, it's so tangible. You can actually feel that in your limbic system. We know we're fine, but we're like burning resentment. And it's funny, it can be like small slights, like they didn't email you back fast enough, or like actual sin that we just let foster and foment. The longer the unresolved pain from sin or offenses, interpersonal offenses lingers, the quicker the virus of disunity and destruction moves through the family. And before you know it, the whole family's sick. I think what we think most about disunity is we think where Satan is going to strike to create disunity is bad doctrine. Like that's not impossible. But that's harder to do than for Satan to begin to divide friendships because someone ghosted them or they heard a rumor or there was a small slight or they said something they didn't. Like it's far easier for Satan to, to dissolve the bonds of unity because what happens is you come into church and you say, well, I don't want to see that person and so I'm going to go around this way. And if you let that go unchecked, you go, I don't, I don't even want a chance going to church this morning because they might see, they might come unexpectedly to my service, Right? And before you know it, you're like, I can't even go to a church where this person exists because, because I might see them and the hurt was so much. And then someone says, hey, how are you doing with this person? You go, I'm fine. Everything's great. Satan will use anything at his disposal, small slights, the wrong tone, or large sin, or differing political or theological views to divide what God has united in his son, Jesus. And so what if there was a way, almost an inoculation of viral love that we could practice with one another that would uh, begin to fight against and fight, fight against disunity and for what we've been given the precious, and the precious like, amount of each other, the precious gift of each other? It's like what's at stake here? A deep unity among the people of God that produces a vibrant gospel witness to the watching world? Like I just can't, like you think about who we are and what we are. Like we are a people that God is united across time of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every political affiliation, every cultural affiliation, every family affiliation, and he's united us together in the blood of Jesus, and he's given us the great gift in each other, and Satan hates that, hates it, hates it. And it doesn't take much for us to jettison it. It doesn't take much for us to walk away from it. It doesn't take much for us to, to leave it. So what's at stake for us? A deep and robust unity that isn't torn apart or torn asunder by small slights or even large sin. It's a deep unity that practices forgiveness openly. It's a witness to the world that unity can be found and maintained through forgiveness. Listen, our cultural era, our cultural moment right now, do you know what is not part of, of our culture? Forgiveness. You make one mistake publicly and you are that mistake irreparably. You're canceled. There's a reason we call it cancel culture because it's not cancel and reprogram. It's not rerun. It's you're done. 
There's no, there's no framework for reconciliation that requires someone to give forgiveness. And all I'm saying is uh, 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 we are a church united, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every different people group, all and in this room, different families, different backgrounds, all of that, we're united. It shouldn't work. It shouldn't work that we would actually get, to get along. It shouldn't work that we would love one another. Why? Because we're sinners. Like that's, that's what's working against us. It's not the other person that's working against this. It's you and me that are working against this. So many of us walk around carrying and cultivating small resentments, small bitternesses, small slights, and we do this. It's fine. It's not that big a deal. But inside, we're cultivating this fire that ultimately will consume us. And so like you ask the question, like, why is it when I read the Bible, like, I don't feel God's presence, I don't, I don't get any truth from it. Well, I, like, I just I want to offer this. Maybe it's not because you don't have the right method, but it's because the resentment that you fomented, that you're flourishing in your own soul, won't cooperate with the Spirit. The Spirit says, listen, that resentment that is flaming in your soul, I can't even, you can't hear me over that. Or what if it's not that like, you can't worship because of the song or the tune or whatever, but it's because you've cultivated bitterness against a brother or sister, and it stands in the way of God ministering to you and you being ministered to by God. It's hard to run the race that God has set before us. If we've taken a one-man race and made it a three-legged race and just tied up with Satan, like, no kidding, it's hard. No kidding, it's hard to unite with people, to love people. For what it's worth, for what it's worth this morning. I hate this sermon. I, I would, like, pick it up and, like, study it. And Holy Spirit, like, what about that thing? You're like, oh! And I pick it up, like, Wednesday. What about that thing? Stop! wrote this in fits and starts. Ministry, my ministry, like my work is a ministry of the heart and relationships and you just acquire, it's like, it's like a lot of us, we just acquire hurt and pain and, and arrows from different people and I'm not unique in that way. It's just my, my job is wired like that and uh, it is easy, what I have found this week, it is easy to deceive myself. Everything's fine. Everything's good. So I speak not as someone who's figured this out, but as one that God is disciplining in the moment. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to read John 13, 35. I want to talk a little bit about unity, define it a couple different ways. Uh, and then I want to go to 1 Peter 4, 8 uh, and, and begin to tease that out. And then I have some flow charts. It's going to be a great, I'm just going to, I'm basically going to throw information at you. I didn't know what to cut out and what didn't. So we're going over. So here we go. Uh, John 13, 35, have a pencil or a pen. There's a lot here. Uh, by this, all people will know. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, this is his upper room discourse and He's, he's telling the disciples, listen, there's going to be a time really soon where I'm not going to be with you. That's the crucifixion. He's going to be dead uh, and he'll rise again. But he's also speaking to the time where he's going to ascend and leave the disciples forever. He's saying, listen, right now, people know you're my disciples because you walk around with me. But there will be a time when the world will look at you and the number one characteristic about whether or not they'll know if you follow me or not will be how well you love one another that for the people of faith, us, what Jesus is saying is the primary, the primary characteristic that we are to distinguish ourselves by for public consumption is love for one another. Now, like, listen, if you and I wrote this, we'd write it way different, right? It'd be, it'd be something like, listen, they will know we are his disciples if they vote the way I want them to vote. They will know that you're my disciples if you share your faith every day. They will know uh, you are my disciples if you follow this theologian or hate that theologian. They will know you're my disciples if you give this much or go this much or watch this or don't watch that. We'll put whatever, whatever we want in here. And Jesus says, listen, 
my church, the people who will follow me, the primary, the primary characteristic, the way the world who is headed into a crisis eternity full of vitriol and anger, we will be a people of love. And if we do that, the world will notice. The world will notice. And I say this as a caveat, like, holiness does distinguish us, like personal holiness and having conviction about what the word of God says, like that distinguishes us and that is important and that, that is a public witness as well. And yet Jesus says, listen, if you don't love one another, the, the world won't see whose disciples you are. How well we live with one another will become a testimony of change and who we are. And so we ask ourselves the question, are we willing to put aside lesser things in pursuit of the beauty of the unity of what Christ has given us in each other. That way, really what I'm asking is, like, is it okay? Do we, are we willing to love one another more than we love being right? Are we willing to love one another more than we love winning an argument? Are we willing to love one another more than we are willing to be vindicated or having, have, have justice at every turn? Like unity, unity. Like I, I'm not here trying to peddle that the best thing you can have is, is tight relations. I want our eyes on something larger, that there's something mo- larger at stake than whether or not you're friends with everyone. It's whether or not God is glorified by the people that he's redeemed, loving one another well enough to survive all the diversity that is here. That is much more compelling than whether or not I got friends. You have friends at CrossFit. I don't know why you'd go, but you could do that. Like, what I'm saying is, if our vision is for the gift that God has given us in each other, we'll ask that question differently. We'll say, yes, I'm willing not to be right all the time because what that means is we get to preserve the beautiful thing that God has given us in each other. A couple of things about unity. I've used the word unity. I want to I say what unity is not. I want to define it a couple different ways. Uh, unity is not uniformity. Uh, what I'm saying is, if we understand the Godhead, if we understand who God is, his nature, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. There are three distinct persons not, not expressions of God, but three distinct persons in one essence, okay? They are completely united. Their diversity is not a, a hindrance to their unity. It's a feature of it. What I'm saying is when we look around the room, God's not asking all of us to become the same person, to think the same way, to have the same background. In the future, Revelation shows us it's a picture, a beautiful tapestry from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. It is not some singular, we don't lose our uniqueness in coming to Christ. We retain it. Diversity is a feature, not a bug of Christianity. It's a feature. Like that's what it's meant to be. All of us are created in the image of God. And by that, we have this beautiful place in God's kingdom, in God's tapestry of what he's created. Like how lame would it be if he's like, I'm just going to paint with one color. It's going to be purple. Be lame. I'm colorblind. I'd tell you that'd be lame. Unity is not about uniformity. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Unity is also not not about unanimity. That is to say, it's possible, actually really hard, to have unity even if we don't agree on really significant things. Like as a Christian. As a Christian, there are certain things one must believe to be a Christian, right? Right? If you don't believe those things, we call those first order issues in theology, uh, like the virgin birth and uh, the two natures of Christ, uh, that he's fully God and fully man and uh, the triune God and uh, justification by faith. That is, we are saved, not of anything we do. Like, there's just, there's uh, six, seven, eight things <clears throat> that over the years, church history has said, listen, if you don't, like, if you don't hold these basic things, you're not one of us, Right? And so uh, we say, like, you don't, you don't have to agree with everything, but you've got to agree with these things to be a Christian. And then there's a bunch of, like, practical considerations about gifts or about baptism or about, uh, uh, about a whole host of things where we say, okay, we agree on these first order things. It is not required that we all agree on every possible aspect of theology. You know what we'd love to argue about until the end? We'd love to argue about when Jesus is coming back, Right? If I asked you to raise your hand, like 90% of you would be like, I want to know who the Antichrist is. I want to know when Jesus is coming back. Is it pre, post, mid, ah? Like we just begin to like sing and and like all of this. And and that that is deeply significant. It is. It's significant to us. It's not unimportant. But like, you know why we don't know? Because Jesus said you won't know. 
I mean, he's coming back. I, like there's clarity. There's some, like, I, like I'm not, not trying to dismiss it, but like we've been arguing with the same thing and there hasn't been some like clarity until someone says he's coming back in 1984 and that didn't work. I'm just rambling. Anyway, look, the, the goal for the Christian is agreement on these first order issues and then clarity and charity on everything else. So like what we, we need to start understanding is that it's okay if we understand that our opinions are not truth. That what we think, just because we think it, doesn't make it irrevocably true. You tracking with me? So in order to have like unity on second order and third order things, we need to at least express some humility and say, man, I might not have this all together, but I want to have this really important discussion and I love you more than the discussion. So like, let's hang out and have really robust discussions, but let's not leave each other over it. Does that make sense? Unity is not about unanimity. It's not about uniformity. And say, like, what we're talking about here is unity is choosing to love one another despite our differences and in spite of our hurt. Unity is choosing to love one another despite our differences and in spite of our hurt. In other words, we have to acknowledge that difference exists. And we can either say that's a bad thing or a glorious thing. That if there's diversity in the Trinity, we should expect the church of Jesus Christ to express that diversity so that we can glory in the fact that our Creator did not, did not come, become lax in creating beauty with us. And that we say, listen, if we're, if we're a bunch of sinners who've been blood-bought, that there's going to be brokenness that is intentional, sin, and then unintentional, immature brokenness that happens, almost a, a, a small offenses that are just part of living together. And we have to decide, how are we going to love one another in that way? Look, the only way this works is not through a bunch of tips and tricks, It's remembering that everything we were, the depths of our brokenness, all of our rebellion has already been paid for, right? That all of our sin, the worst things we've done, thought, or even expressed have been paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. And you say, listen, Pastor Mark, I agree with that. That's super good. I'm here for that. But you don't know what that person said to me. You don't know what that person did to me. And I would never do anything like that to anyone else. I would never, I couldn't even conceive that. I've never done something that bad. Listen, there's a form of self-righteousness that will not allow us to acknowledge how deeply broken we were and acknowledge how, how much our sin, uh, our sin weighed on Christ. And so like we say, listen, the only way we can find love, the only way we can find reconciliation is if we look backwards and realize how much we've been forgiven. And if you say, listen, I've never done something that bad, there is this self-righteousness. And you know what you're like, what you're saying is my sin did not weigh on Jesus as heavily as theirs. And I'm here to tell you this morning, God grades the gravity of our sin and it all weighed equal on Jesus. All of it. All of it. So what do I do, though, when someone sins against me or offends me? What do I do when we can't agree on second or third issues? What do I do when people sin against me and how can I fight for unity despite being hurt or offended? 1 Peter 4, 8 says this. Uh, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Proverbs nineteen eleven: good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is glory to overlook an offense. First, first Peter, uh, Peter's addressing uh, a group of uh, scattered saints in Galatia, and, and he's, he's encouraging them, eternity's coming, and he's preparing them for what is coming. And he's saying, listen, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. That, that, that Greek word has this sense of rugged, dogged, never letting go, can't be dissuaded, can't be stopped. This kind of really rough, not, not, not fickle or, or easy, easy to run away. It is standard stalwart. I don't know how many more words I can put to it. Like, it's big. It's strong. It's forceful. You can't be dragged out of it. So keep doing that, he says. Since love covers a multitude of sins, what he's saying is, listen, uh, you're going to be with these people for eternity. So it'd be good if you started practicing now how to love them when it's really hard. Eternity will be sweeter if you start doing that now. Love covers a multitude of sins. Solomon says, listen, good sense makes one slow to anger. He's saying, listen, wisdom makes us less likely to have a quick fuse. Wisdom gives us a a long fuse, a slow fuse. So we don't just react in the moment. So we're not just always flying off the handle. 
so, so that offense doesn't turn into something worse. And it's a person's glory to overlook an offense. In other words, grace and relational peace are hallmarks of a self-controlled Christian. So let me just, let me get into this. Sin, like how does, how does love cover a multitude of sins? Well, it does it by this. If you want to cover a multitude of sins, it requires these four things. Number one, Covering sin requires an acknowledgement or acknowledging sin occurred. That is to say, when we're covering sin, we're not sweeping it under the rug. Okay? We're not, we're not saying it didn't happen. If you want to love somebody, if you want to forgive somebody, if you want your love to cover their sin, it's an acknowledgement that something happened. It's not denial. That, that if this is going to work, if Peter's saying, listen, continue to love one another earnestly because love covers a multitude of sins, this is kind of the secret sauce for, for deep unity, then we have to acknowledge that there was sin. For you to say, well, well, you know, like, it wasn't a big deal. Like, don't deny the fact that someone sinned against you. You can't cover it in love. You can cover it with resentment, but that hurts everybody. Number two, you've got to take stock of the hurt. Takes out of the hurt. You can say, listen, uh, someone sinned against me, but I'm fine. I'm good. I've forgiven them. But you sit with it and you say, well, wait a second. If sin brings death every time, this person that sinned against me, like, what did it do to me? What death did I experience? What hurt? What sorrow? What, what did it do in me? That if you're going to let love cover a multitude of sins deeply, you've got to acknowledge that sin actually occurred, that we are about truth, and we have to acknowledge that that sin always brings death of some sort into a relationship. Number three, you begin forgiveness early. You begin forgiveness early. That you say there was a sin, here was the brokenness, here was the cost of it, and I'm going to start forgiving right now. I, I want to say this really quickly. Resentment and bitterness are not accidental things. You just like bump into being resentful. You don't just bump into being bitter. The bitterness and resentfulness are are holding a grudge. Those are things you nurse into existence. You fuel that fire until it's large and burning in your heart. Resentment is a sign of, of a couple of things. One, spiritual immaturity. Number two, gospel deficit that we have this deficit within us that says, you know what, like they don't deserve to be forgiven. I would never do that. There's, their sin is too great. It's too big. If you don't start forgiving early and often, you will start resenting early and often. Forgiveness is not accidental. It's not accidental. Number, number four, you have to continue forgiving often. Forgiveness is not like a, something you do at one point in time. It's something you do one point in time many times. But like, forgiveness is a process. You've heard this. It's, it's not just something you do once. Yeah, I'm over it. Almost never is that the case. If that is the case, the hurt likely wasn't that big a deal. And you're at a point in spiritual maturity where you say, I can actually forgive and let that move on. But some of us have so much hurt and so much trauma. Like, that is legit. Someone has really hurt us, really sinned against us. When every time we see them, this thing almost in our soul and our limbic system is, Ugh! and there's this tightness. And like, that requires us in that moment to say, either I'm going to give in to resentment, I'm going to give in to grudge holding, or I'm going to forgive. Like, forgiveness is a moment in time a bunch of different times, a bunch of different times. Letting love cover sin does not always require you to go to the person either. Like this is part of, this is part of just living together. That if we're going to, we're going to let love cover, uh, cover, uh, cover sins and we're going to overlook offenses. What we're really saying is I'm going to try not to nitpick the family of God into heaven. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not just going to badger them with all the wrong things they're going to do because someone's doing, someone's overlooking my offenses, someone's overlooking my sin and, and covering it. So I want to do that so we all know we get to heaven just nitpicked into eternity. Some sin, I just say this, some sin is uh, patterned sin. Some sin is abuse of egregious kinds. Some sin is unrepentant where we kind of fast forward and kind of approach this differently. But I just, for the run of the mill, like brokenness among us, like, forgiveness, acknowledgement of sin, acknowledgement of brokenness and forgiveness are the first few things we do. In many cases, if someone sinned against you, forgiveness and forbearance are the first and most important steps. It doesn't feel fair. It doesn't feel right. We feel like we're not vindicated. Don't you just know what they did? I need someone to tell me that I'm right in my anger, that I'm right in my sin or whatever. I, I need to have that forgiveness and forbearance. Put that in the right perspective. 
We must cultivate the rugged ability to forgive. Like here's the thing. Forgiveness is not weakness. It's freedom. Forgiveness is not weakness. It's freedom. You know, Jesus was teaching about, uh, in Matthew 18, how to, how to, how to deal with uh, uh, quite a few different types of conflict, right? And he says in Matthew 18, here's what you should do. If, you, if your brother sins against you, you should go to him directly. If he doesn't respond, then you should bring someone else. If he doesn't respond, you should treat him like a tax collector or a Gentile. And, and, and so he's he, <laughs> so good. Peter is such a knucklehead. So Jesus is like setting this up, right? And literally like the next thing out of Peter's mouth is go, okay, okay. No, I hear you, Jesus. But what about, like, if I do it more than once? Is there a process where I don't have to do that? <laughs> like, it is like, here's how you do it, Peter. But hold on, Jesus. What if he does it 10 times? Like, how many times is really, like, is this process? And what does he say? 70 times 7. That I just, for the Christian, regardless of the pain, forgiveness is not optional. It's not. And so any, any solution to reconciliation that doesn't require forgiveness of us is not, a, is not one that reflects who Jesus is. When we forgive, we break the bonds of resentment and bitterness and judgmentalism and self-righteousness. Forgiveness requires us to say, you know what? They don't deserve this. They've hurt me, uh, but I want to look back to what I did to Jesus and what, I, what, what sins held them there. And I want to look back and say, he gave me forgiveness. And I want to be a conduit of grace and mercy to the undeserved. Like, imagine this. What is more like Jesus Christ than when we forgive someone else? Can you think of something that is more characteristic of his grace, of his mercy, than when we say, listen, this person hurt me, they don't deserve this, but I want to be more like Jesus, and so I want to work at having a soft heart. I want to work at forgiveness. I want to be most like his grace and mercy for this person who doesn't deserve it because they need it, just like I need it, just like I needed it. We reflect most of his mercy and grace when we forgive. I want to show you a flow chart, okay? I saw this from a guy named Matt Smethurst. He was on the Twitter. If you start on the right, I guess your left, right? Church members, sin is bothering you. And the, church members, sin can bother you because it's, it, it's, they sin against you or they're sinning against someone else. So if it's yes, you go up. The first step is forgiveness, like we see these commands. We want to shortcut something else. We want to, we want to go to the end. We want to, want, to, want to find our way around this. But like the, the forgiveness as a first step is not an option. I'm not saying it's easy. I, I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to be flippant about it, but I just want to impress upon us any method of, re, of dealing with reconciliation that isn't first a Christian reconciling with themselves who God is, what he's done, and desiring to extend that for someone else is a step in the wrong direction for reconciliation. And so then you get to this moment where it's like, okay, I've started forgiving them and I'm working on it. And then you kind of get this weird gray area, right? We say, does the sin continue to bother you? Whether for your sake, maybe you just can't get over it. You can't let go. The pain was too deep uh, or there was a relationship that's broken and you just want that relationship back. Or you say, man, this is a pattern sin. They keep doing this to me over and over. It's harder to say no. It's harder to have, do that unreconciled. There are some things that God is looking and kind of prompting in us for unity. Harder confrontation. We call it confrontation, which is like a, it's a bad word, but it just means to come face to face with somebody. Just to, just to come face to face with them and say, hey, like, you really hurt me when you did this. Here was the impact of that on me. And I'll let you know, I forgive you and I love you. The vast majority, I think the vast majority of sin, like you can probably approach the person individually. Have you, pro, have you worked, through, uh, worked through forgiveness? You know, I, you know what we do though often? I'll chat about it in a second. Is We go, is the sin against you? And our first step then is to find someone else to talk about it with. You go, hey, I need you, I need you to listen. I don't, you know, John did this thing to me and I just need to be heard out. And, you know, I, I want to, I want to talk to you about it. And, uh, and so what we'll do is we'll, we'll begin, we'll kind of skip to the end there. And we'll, we just want, we want someone to hear us out and we want someone to, to talk us through our pain. And like, I'm not saying there's not value in that, but like, let me just encourage you. Do not skip, do not involve people at the very beginning, unless they're spiritually more mature than you. Don't go to your peer group, find people who've walked with the Lord 
Don't find someone early on unless their spirit's mature and unless you're willing to be vague about the details because often when we talk about people sinning against us, we're just gossiping and slandering. If we're just being completely honest. So don't go unless they're spiritually more mature than you, unless you're willing to be vague. And number three, this is critically important. Do not go to somebody to share about someone else sinning against you unless you are looking for help on how to be holy. Because you put that person in a really awkward position to receive gossip or receive some bad news. And what are they supposed to do with it? Now they've got it. That person sometimes will do this, go talk to someone else, which is like the worst thing because then it's triangulation and you've got three different people talking about this one person over here and no one's doing anything holy. So I just encourage you, forgive first. Allow the Lord to figure out what needs to happen. Pursue reconciliation. Most of these things can be handled one-on-one. Not all of them, certainly. Find someone who's more spiritually mature. And look, if someone comes to you, if someone comes to you and says, hey, someone did something to me, and they want to talk about it, can I, just, can I just encourage you to do this? Say, listen, I'd love to hear, but I want to help you be holy too. So I want to help you learn how to forgive. I want, to learn, I, want to, I want you to learn how to go to this person. And I guarantee you, if that person wanted to gossip, they're not going to talk to you. And you've just relieved yourself of some stress. Don't be a person who allows gossip to sit. Don't be a person who allows someone to come and not move towards holiness. This is hard work, 100%. So help them do it. Help them do the hard work. The bottom, if someone sins against someone else, you see someone else sinning in the community uh, of God. Uh, is the sin against you? No. Number one, you pray for them, and then you just shut your mouth for a while. Does that make sense? Like they didn't sin against you, so you want the Holy Spirit to convict them of sin. You know why? Because we're really bad at conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit's really good at it. We're really good at shame and guilt, which is not the same thing. And then you go down. How, how confident are you? Did, you? did you hear this? Was this some weird game of telephone where this person said this and this person saw this and you're getting it interpreted three or four different ways? Like I'd say it's probably not a great idea to try to confront someone on, on like telephone sin. That's a bad idea. How serious is it? Bring it up with them. Go to them. Is there a theological disagreement at the root? That is to say, like, uh, is, is, is this something you regard as sin but they have theological freedom for? If so, probably just going to have to live with it. If not, how do we agree together? How do we, how do we live together in, in light of the disputed behavior? All I'm saying is like, there's a process here that allows us to work through and pursue one another. But we sabotage this all the time. We, let me give you four quick ways about how we sabotage, let love cover a multitude of sins. Number one is we go to others too soon. We've talked about this. Like our first instinct is to go share it with people in prayer or whatever. And it's like, can you believe? I'd like you to pray for John. Here's what he did to me. Like that's, we go to others too soon. We want to be heard. Go to the person. Number two, we don't forgive. We've been hurt too badly. And so we're not, we, don't, we don't want to. We're not willing to. We don't want to pursue that. We assume the worst. We cancel them in our minds. We say this is who they are. There can be no change. And so because of that, we are, they're, they're, I mean, we don't say this dramatically, but they're dead to us. We avoid them. They are that person. They're, 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 they're unsafe and can never be safe again or whatever, whatever it is. We just, we're excused for forgiveness because that's who they are. Or number four, this one I hear all the time as a pastor, we write the end of the story ourselves. Where you go and say, listen, like I want you to go talk to this person. And they say, well, listen, I know how it's going to end. They're just not going to listen to me or they may hurt me again or, or, or. We begin writing out of our own brokenness a despair, hopeless ending. And we say, God, God couldn't change this. God can't change them. And so we've written in the ending, which means we don't have to do it. If it's going to end poorly, if it's a guarantee, but we don't write the future. So what if we do if, we, if it's not sin, though? Like uh, Proverbs 19, 11, if it's a glory to overlook an offense, like what if it's not sin? And it's just we're immature people living in a broken world and communi- communication's a big deal. They ghosted you. They didn't email you back soon enough or they stopped hanging out with you or, or, or you know, they're... Uh, <laughs> or they're just, they, they, they have this thing. They have a different opinion on things than you. That's real dangerous. I, what would happen if someone had a disagreement with you? That just brings me back to my point. You're not always right. So we can just live with it and start living with it joyfully. Like, can I just say this about 
uh, an offense. Like, if it's not a pattern, you probably could overlook it. If it's sin, go back to the top of the flow chart. Is it a differing opinion? Like, you may not be right either. So let's live with it. If you can overlook it, overlook it. If you can't overlook it, go to the person about it. We are meant to be a people who love one another enough to address the really important things about life, to encourage one another in holiness and not to nitpick each other into annoyance and into discouragement. What's at stake here? A deep unity among the people of God that produces a vibrant gospel witness to the watching world. Just imagine for a second. I mean this. That 5,000 meals thing we're doing, having meals with people. Imagine if they interacted with people from this church, right, who would not cancel them. Who they could be the version of themselves with, and they would get love and acceptance and forgiveness. Like, what if we were a people who were a conduit of God's mercy, and through the relationship with us that we've cultivated here, that we're moving out into the community, that like people would come and be like, man, forgiveness is a real powerful thing, and I want more of that. Well, Jesus gives you all of it. Like, imagine what that would be if we were dedicated enough to loving one another, and that began to seep out into the world and seep out into the relationships we've got where you couldn't be canceled here at Church of the Gates. We love you too much, and your eternity is too important to write you off. Disunity is a dangerous contagion. Viral love, though, a viral love can destroy that contagion if we're willing to do the hard work and start with forgiveness. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. And guys, even as I think about all that was in this, got all the charts and outline points and but even in my head, it feels very confusing. So I, just what I want for your people, what I want for myself, is that you would develop in us and you would help us cultivate actively a love for one another, this gift you've given us in each other. We would not spurn it. We would not treat it uh, transactionally, God, but we would recognize that what you have given us in each other is sweet and beautiful and worthy of fighting for, that we would love one another more than we love being right. We would love one another more than we would love vindication or justice. That you would give us the ability, the supernatural and miraculous ability, to let love cover a multitude of sins. And that we might find glory in overlooking offenses. And this might be a sweet place for us and for the world to see your grace and mercy worked on. In your name we pray. Amen.